I want to share a new movie pitch I received the other day. I think it could be a real blockbuster. Here it is. In a world where technology is rapidly advancing and the lines between humanity and artificial intelligence are becoming blurred, a new threat emerges that could potentially destroy everything we know. In an action-packed Marvel movie, Mehdi Hassan finds himself debating the ethics and morality of AI technology with a rogue group of scientists who are determined to push the boundaries of what is possible. As the debate heats up, the scientists reveal they have created a powerful AI machine that could revolutionize the world. But at what cost? How's that for the Hollywood treatment? Now, I wish I could tell you that this pitch came from some writer's room at Marvel HQ, maybe from the Russo brothers themselves. But it was actually written by ChatGPT, an artificial intelligence text generator that amassed more than 100 million active users within two months of its launch, setting the record for the fastest growing consumer internet app in history. Created by the company OpenAI, ChatGPT responds to people's requests in a way that goes far beyond Alexa or Siri or that oh-so-quaint Google search. It can write high school essays. It can write and even fix computer code. Some people use it to consult on personal issues, almost like a therapist. It has plenty of creative range. If you prefer Shakespeare to Marvel, how about this? We asked it. Oh, Mehdi Hassan, with fervent heart, a man who loves to take a part in discussing issues that grip the land and with his words makes a stand. In American politics, he finds his place, a realm of intrigue and heated debate where ideas clash and tempers rise and truth is sought through many a guise. How's that for you? Chat GPT. It's at the center of internet attention and it's fueled what's been called an AI arms race, bringing a new energy to the artificial intelligence industry. But also plenty of concerns from critics who point to its alarming ability to generate convincing lies or realistic and detailed conspiracy theories. The chief executive of NewsGuard, a company that tracks online misinformation, called Chat GPT the most powerful tool for spreading misinformation that has ever been on the internet. And just two weeks ago, Elon Musk, who co-founded OpenAI, signed a letter with more than a thousand AI experts calling for an immediate pause on giant AIs as they continue to study the potential dangers of chat GPT. Now, loath as I may be to agree with Elon Musk, when I think about artificial intelligence, I'll admit this is the scenario I'm worried about. Did we just forget about the Terminator? Did Kyle Reese die for nothing? Did the T-800 lower himself into a vat of molten steel for nothing? Skynet, people, that's what I think of, Skynet. On the other hand, proponents do make a convincing case for why generative AI could be, well, revolutionary. They say it could transform healthcare, improve cancer screening, and provide around-the-clock medical advice to people with chronic illnesses. It can also help fill in the gaps for industries that desperately need more assistance, like cybersecurity. Now, obviously, I'm not an AI expert, I'm not a scientist, though this AI art generator did create some interesting portraits of me as a mad scientist, thank you, AI. But I am a journalist, and if there's one thing I can do, it's ask questions to interesting and informed people. So let's bring in two AI experts for a real debate on this issue. Joining me now are experts with opposing views on how to move forward. Gary Marcus wants a pause on certain AI development. He's CEO and founder of Geometric Intelligence and NYU professor emeritus and co-author of Rebooting AI. Joshua Gans has spoken out against a pause on AI development. He's chief economist of Creative Destruction Lab, a professor at University of Toronto's Rotman School of Management and co-author of Prediction Machines. Thank you both for joining me. Uh, now, before we get too into the weeds, I'd like you to tell us, but both of you, tell our audience, what's your initial reaction to ChatGPT and everything we've learned about it over the past few months? Do you think it's a force for good or a force for bad? I mean, it has over 100 million monthly users. Clearly, it's a big, big deal. Uh, Joshua, let me start with you and then Gary. Uh, I think it's uh, extraordinarily exciting. Uh, I've, I don't think I've uh, had a peer or product that has been so immediately useful uh, to not only myself, but a whole lot of other people uh, so quickly and so obviously. Uh, I just find it uh, quite extraordinary. They took a big, big bet on developing it and seeing whether it would be uh, useful. And I think it's really, really paying off. And I'm just excited for what this is going to bring. And uh, quick, quick, quick follow up. What do you use it for? You said you've already started immediately. Using it. What kind of things do you use it for? 
So I've used it to, you know, uh, help a little bit of uh, getting rid of procrastination when I'm writing. I've helped. I've used it to, uh, with a colleague, to develop uh, a, a virtual TA that can take all the readings from our courses and uh, lecture transcripts, and then provide a chatbot for students. So these sorts, and this is just in in the yeah. first few months. Gary. Well, of course, students have also used it for plagiarism. Um, many of the uses are good and many are bad. I don't think anybody would deny that it's going to save a lot of people typing. It's going to make a lot of people more productive. But misinformation, one of the things that you brought up is a serious problem, especially the uses by bad actors to make misinformation at scale in a way we've never seen before. I agree with the NewsGuard folks about that. Um, there's also accidental misinformation. So we saw last week that a law professor, Jonathan Turley, was accused of sexual harassment based on nothing but the hallucination of these models. They make stuff up. If you ran your own biography, you would see that. Um, Bard made up five lies about me in one paragraph, got the name, the subtitle of my book wrong, made up quotes, things I didn't say, and so forth. So there's a lot of misinformation, some of which um, may, for example, defame people. There are risks that these new technologies are going to be used to develop new toxins. There are risks that they're going to be used for cybercrime to um, fake people out and get them to send money or give them the credentials on, on the web and so forth. So there are obviously positive uses. There are obviously negative uses. The biggest problem in my mind is we have no handle on this as yet of how many negative uses, how many positive uses, what we can do about them, like what we can do about the misinformation or the defamation or any of them, really. There was a, a list by OpenAI of 12 different risks. And they said, hey, there are these risks. We're not going to tell you how the model works works. We don't have any solutions. Go have fun, everybody. And that, to me, so, is a little bit scary. So, uh, Joshua, isn't the fun point a problem that people are having fun and misinformation is undeniable, as Gary points out? I mean, I just want to show you this image of the Pope uh, in a giant puffer jacket that went viral a few weeks ago. And many people, and I include myself here, for a moment believed it was real. Hey, why not? It's the Pope. Uh, same story in the days leading up to Trump's indictment. These images of Trump being carried away by law enforcement. People got a good laugh out of those photos, but it does remind us of the capacity for chat GPT, for AI in general, to produce deep fakes, to spread misinformation, whether wittingly or unwittingly, Joshua. So I think, you know, uh, this hasn't changed the incentives of bad actors to uh, engage in those sorts of things. The question is really, how are we uh, going to deal with it? Uh, misinformation can be created all the time. Um, sometimes that misinformation changes your view about something. I don't think any, any of us changed our view about the Pope after seeing that one. Um, and then sometimes, and this is the real concern, it might actually cause some damage because it causes people to do certain actions. Um, it's very easy for us to characterize misinformation. Gary already gave a great number of examples of that, and he's done uh, so in many of his other writings with respect to AI. It's not perfect. That's absolutely true. But the question we have to ask ourselves is how easy will it be able to use these things in order to generate real damaging consequences? And I guess my issue with the people who are causing uh, for us to find out more about these things is how will you know unless we put it out there in the market and see? Uh, how will we know okay. if let's, it's going to actually Let's do have Gary respond to that. Gary, how will we know unless we try this stuff out? So there's a couple of things. One, one is that Joshua left out the volume and quality of the misinformation. So um, you know, it used to be that troll farms would write this by hand. They would pay people a lot of money. But the economics have changed. It's basically the cost of misinformation is now zero. And the ability to scale it, to have millions or billions of copies, and not just copies, but variations on a theme generated very quickly, that's basically here, and, and it has no cost. On the how, how much of it is there, I keep pushing Jan LeCun, who's at Facebook, um, or Meta, the chief AI officer there, to give us data about how misinformation is changing over time, and he hasn't given it. I've also asked, um, I guess, people I don't want to say on the record who, who might have some information about this. Nobody has a good measure, and that's an example of the problem that we have. We have all of these potential risks. Another is, how often does chat search make medical misinformation? We don't even have a measure of that. There's so many places where we're just flying bl blind. And so, you know, I'm not going to say so the pause letter is the right thing, but it raises the question of we are moving very fast, and we don't We're, even have measures to evaluate the problems. We'll come back to the pause letter in a moment. Just on the actuals, dealing with the actual AI risks, advantages. Uh, Joshua, deal with that point that Gary raises about um, this idea that 
it's just not accurate, the stuff that's coming out. We're calling it artificial intelligence, but what if it's not very intelligent? What if it's producing nonsense in terms of... I've seen plenty of people online say, I put in my name, asked for a biog, and it produced information about me that's just not true. How is that going to help people? Well, I think it helps people when they're using the tools to become actual skeptics about them. Uh, I, I'm, I'm in favour of generally just uh, being part and connected with technology to do that. Um, I think, I think uh, there are, you know, legitimate concerns that when a, any tool that is uh, that people perceive as some sort of authority develops something of misinformation, uh, they might react on it. So that could be the case. However, I is really, uh, I, 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 we, in order to get that healthy skepticism in society, in order to, therefore come up with the solutions to these things, which are institutions uh, that are more trustworthy in putting this uh, out, you have to actually experiment with it in public. Uh, so, you know, Gary says we don't know and has some idea that Facebook might know. I'm not so sure about that. Um, what I would like to do is see independent researchers be able to study its actual okay. behaviour in the wild and determine that. Gary, we, we're going to study, the, we're gonna study the horses after they've left the barn. That's that's the thing here. The the problem is the speed at which this is all moving. <laughs> there was a it piece very... this morning in in the Financial Times um, saying we're giving uh, or we're trying to build godlike AI, and I don't think the AI we have now is anything like godlike. I think it's actually mediocre of telling all of these lies. But we are giving it godlike powers, and we're doing that so, without so having Gary... done the research. So, Gary, you mentioned kind of after the horse has bolted. What is your solution or proposal? Because I know you, along with Musk and uh, hundreds of other AI experts, signed this letter calling for a pause on, quote, giant AI technology. Uh, how practical is that? And you know that other tech leaders, for example, former Google CEO Eric Schmidt, have pointed out that this would just give a leg up to China, for example. I mean, how do you do a pause yeah. when you can't stop the entire world from pausing? It would just be a bunch of people in America, wouldn't it, Gary? I'm not that worried about China having GPT-5. I think people have over-elaborated what they think GPT-5 would actually do. It's still going to tell lies. It's still not going to be able to track the world very well. It's not going to be some great military tool. So I'm not that worried about that. But I think more generally, whether we have a pause or not, that we need to move towards global um, policy on AI. We need to work together on this. I'll be talking about that in my TED Talk on Tuesday, how we might work as an entire uh, world uh, to try to make policies that are consistent and uniform and helpful um, and keep us all safe. Joshua, are you against global regulation? Do you trust tech companies to police themselves, open AI, when it comes to stuff like this? No, I trust none of those things. I, I don't think any of them will really work. I've, you know, I've been, my main study is in innovation. And all too often, we've seen preemptive regulations uh, that have been posed by private companies and by governments uh, to regulate various things that have been turned out to be quite harmful to that. I think we saw a lot of that, let's face, during the pandemic and the sorts of things we would uh, allow people in the public to use. Um, I'm not uh, saying, claiming that this should be any sort of uh, uh, libertarian stance. In fact, what I would like to do is set up the processes by which we actually understand what we're trying to measure for, and so that we, when we see there's an issue, we we can deal with it. You know, there's this example from a few years ago when Microsoft put out a chatbot on Twitter and then it became a Nazi in 24 hours. Everybody calls that a disaster for AI. However, it was a tremendously successful experiment because it showed them, Microsoft and everybody else, how quickly that could happen. Well, it's the only way to do this. And then, that, and then no, Sydney did on, crazy yeah. things and they didn't take it down. I mean, I think Tay was a perfectly fine lesson. It was a small deployment for a day. The problem is now we have things that are deployed to hundreds of millions of users day after day. We have none of the research that you and I both agree we well, need to have. On that note, before we run out of time, you, uh, Joshua, you mentioned the uh, becoming a Nazi in 24 hours. There are a lot of movie tropes about AI going evil and taking over the world. I referenced one earlier. Uh, and while they're fictional, there have been some rather unsettling reports about things that have come out of these real-life AI chatbots. New York Times journalist Kevin Roos reported that Bing's AI <laughs> chat told him, I want to be alive. So should we be worried? about AI rising up to take over the world. I mean, a lot of scientists, Joshua, these days talking about AI, they sound like Miles Dyson. And you know what happened to Miles Dyson in the second Terminator movie, don't you, yes. Joshua? <laughs> I do. Look, I love I love all that as much as anybody, um, but I'm here in my role as an economist, and I, I'm here to take those really interesting things and desexify them. 
You know, when it comes down to it, the current architectures for uh, what we call artificial intelligence are just an advance in statistical prediction. They have unbelievably uh, exceeded expectations in what that can do, but they are just predictive engines. That means they can't have the same purposes and other things. Now, they could be okay. programmed and interact with it, but it's the humans we worry about, not the AI. Last word I to you, Gary. 30, se 30 seconds left. Do you I see a Terminator the scenario? That... I'm not worried about the Terminator scenario. I'm worried about the end of democracy. I'm worried about bad actors using these things to destroy the culture of, of trust. I mean, it's already uh, in, in a bad way, and I think they could make us trust nothing because there's so much misinformation spread so widely. Gary Marcus, Joshua Gans, I appreciate you both bringing your very real-life intelligence to this show and uh, unpacking some of this for us. I appreciate you both.